everyone and welcome to our 8am service here this morning and a special welcome to those who are joining us online as well. My name is Emma and I'm joined in leading the service by Andrew and Andrew Schmidt who will be bringing us our sermon a little later on in the service. Let us begin with the greeting on the front of our service outline. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Our sentence of scripture for today from Psalm 119. The earth is filled with your love, Lord. Teach me your decrees. Let us pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus said, this is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. Lord, have mercy on us and write your law in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our Bible readings. Today's Old Testament reading comes from the 19th chapter of the book of Genesis. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered, we will spend the night in the square. But Lot insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of the way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house young and old, with blindness, so that they could not find the door. The two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here, because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry and get out of this place, because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought that he was joking. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they had brought them out, 
One of them said, flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. By the time Lot reached Zoar, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down towards Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham, and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm reading for today is a portion of Psalm 116 from verses 1 to 9 and we'll read this portion responsively. I'll read up to the colon of each verse and then join me for the second half. I love the Lord because he heard my voice, the voice of my supplication, because he inclined his ear to me in the day that I called to him. The cords of death encompassed me, the snares of the grave took hold of me, I was in anguish and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech you, deliver me. Gracious and righteous is the Lord. Full of compassion is our God. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest. For the Lord has rewarded you. For you, O Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as in the beginning, so now and forever. Amen. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 20. Glory Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, They would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Lord Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. Please remain standing as we together affirm our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. 
On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Please be seated, everyone, and good morning to you. My name's Andrew. It's great to see you here today, especially uh, those of you who are online. I know there are probably quite a few online today because the marathon has made it hard for people to get here. And it's unseasonably cold. My decision to put the heaters away does not look that good uh, this morning, so I apologise for that, but we couldn't have known it was going to be this cold so well into September. Now, I want to mention a few items of news which are not on your bulletin. Uh, one of them is our little Wednesday morning prayer group uh, that, that I started off last Wednesday. I was so encouraged by the, the three people who came uh, and we prayed for the lost in Randwick. Uh, this week, I've decided to do it again, and for reasons which have become clear as I preach, I want us to pray about the Ukraine war and that God will bring it to an end. So. Again, same plan as last week. If you can come uh, to pray with me in the side chapel at 9 o'clock this Wednesday, I'll be there and uh, I'll pray on my own if necessary, but we're going to pray about the Ukraine war. Now, the other thing that I want to mention that's not on the bulletin is next week would have been our confirmation service if we had confirmees this year. I saw uh, Bishop Michael Stead yesterday at, at the Synod gathering in the Greenfields and he said to me, do you still want me to come? And I said, well... Yes, uh, we do still want the bishop to come, so he, that will be at the four o'clock service. So next week, why not come to church twice, come along in the morning for our regular service and try out the four o'clock service where we'll have the bishop preaching to us uh, and it'll be great to have him with us. Also, you'll see that I've got some news in the bulletin for you about Jim and Helen, so keep them in your prayers. Uh, now, please uh, join with me as I pray and as we turn to... Genesis chapter 19. Let's pray. Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Please provide today for us, Father, that your word might go deep inside us to transform our thoughts and our desires. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you are joining us today for the first time, if you're new visiting checking out church, uh, maybe even a, a little bit sort of wondering what it'll be like if you haven't been in church for some time. Uh, and as we read today from this passage about Sodom and Gomorrah, which is the original fire and brimstone passage, you might have thought, oh, right, yeah, this is probably what they do every week. But actually it's not. Uh, this is the first time I've ever spoken on this, uh, this harrowing passage in my 15 years in ministry. And it may well be the first time the passage has been read out at St. Jude's on a Sunday in living memory because it's not usually provided for in the lectionary. Uh, so if you are new today, please don't think that we do this every week. We don't. But this week we happen to have come up uh, against this passage in Genesis 19 about Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a harrowing story, isn't it? Uh, it's interesting and it's very well told. But you'd be a strange person if you enjoyed Genesis chapter 19 with uh, this account of the men of Sodom all coming and banging on Lot's door and wanting to treat his guests brutally. Even worse than that is Lot's proposal that he would give his daughters to this brutal crowd. Lot uh, had begun like his uncle Abraham we saw last week showing wonderful hospitality to the strangers. He had made sure that the strangers stayed with him in his house because he knew that the town square of Sodom was not a good place for them to spend the night, and he'd given them a meal and they'd washed their feet. But when Lot offered his own daughters to protect the men from the gang outside his house, 
Well, that was a sense of hospitality which was just running absolutely out of control. Clearly, Lot's moral compass had been thrown out of whack by living in that city. People sometimes ask what particularly is the sin of Sodom, uh, but I don't think it is a particular sin. I think the point that's being made here is this was behaviour by the men of the town which everyone agrees is abhorrent. Uh, there is violence, there is sexual depravity, there is cruelty to strangers and minorities because don't forget Lot is a migrant to this town. There is the persecution of the righteous. There is pride. There's everything wrong with this behaviour. But I don't think we should pick and choose between what parts of God's word we'll read and what we won't, should we? Uh, that's not really up to us. And God's the one who's placed this in his word. And so our question is really the one that I floated to start with. Why does it need to be here? Why has God placed this account of human evil in the Bible? Can I suggest to you that God is being real with us? I mean, human evil is a reality, isn't it? I read only this week, uh, there was a an article in my news feed, you may have seen it as well, about a man who was scammed out of $280,000 uh, by some people who uh, acted, they were masquerading as his bank in connection with a, a property transaction. And these were just criminals. And they somehow felt that it was justified for them to have the $280,000 that this young man had saved for so that he could buy a house, and they felt it was more justified for them to have this money than, he, than for him to have it. Now, I know it's only white-collar crime, but it's wicked to think that people could sleep at night that way, isn't it? That they deserve the money more than he does. Uh, it, it came to my attention this, this week as I was listening to a podcast that there have perhaps been 500,000 people killed in the Ukraine war that started two years ago. 500,000 people have died in this war. Now, if we were to have a minute's silence for each of those people starting now, we would be here this time next year. And all of those people have died essentially because of the decision of one man to try to take land which is not his own. That's, that is evil, isn't it? That is evil. Now, we could multiply examples of human evil in the world, which thankfully I'm not going to do now. When we think about the evil that happens in the world, which we know about, well, the account that we read here in Genesis 19 is quite realistic, isn't it? It is quite realistic to think that humans would do this. It would be surprising if the Bible didn't contain some account of events like this. I mean, imagine if the Bible never had any examples of humans behaving wickedly. Imagine that the only things in the Bible were stories of people being nice to each other. How could the Bible claim to make God better known to us if it were not even straight with us about our own world? Well, no. Evil does need to be described in the Bible because the Bible is realistic. The other good reason for this material to be in God's word is that it forces us to ask the question, what do we think of human evil? Now, if there were no God, human evil would still cause pain, but it would have no greater meaning. It would just be bad luck. And in spite of what moral atheists try to claim, without God, there would be no basis for judging another person's acts as evil. So we couldn't, for example, say, if there were no God, that Vladimir Putin is evil. We could only say that what he is doing causes pain. Now, another view, uh, a common viewpoint, uh, which is 
around these days can be traced to the French philosopher Rousseau. Uh, many people believe this even if they've never heard of Rousseau, uh, who famously began his book, The Social Contract, with this statement, man was born free, but is everywhere in chains. The problem, in other words, according to Rousseau, is social conditions. There's nothing wrong with man himself, it's just that he lets himself down due to a poor education or a poor upbringing or a wrong incentive structure. Human evil, according to Rousseau, it's a policy problem. And it could be fixed by having the right shrinks and the right bureaucrats on the job. The third opinion, which I'm going to suggest to you is the true one, is the view that we read in God's word and particularly in the words of Jesus when he said that evil comes from the human heart. Human evil is sin. It's man's rebellion against God and it is a heart problem. We all have this problem in our heart though it shows itself differently from person to person. And so that means that when we see other people do evil, we're forced to admit that but for the grace of God, maybe I would have been involved in that too. I mean, is there no one here who hasn't been haunted by the thought that if we had lived in Nazi Germany, maybe we might have just gone along as most of the people did with the horrendous things that were being done. So as I think about human evil and what Jesus teaches me about it, the thought that presses on my mind is that this life is a serious business and that we ought to live as though we're going to be held to account. Sodom was about to be held to account that day. After the two men pulled Lot inside the house and made the mob powerless by striking them blind, they immediately changed the subject with Lot and they, they said to Lot, you've got to get out of this city because we're going to destroy it. Verse 12, uh, if you have a look there, it says, they said to Lot, do you have anyone else here? Sons-in-law, sons, daughters, get them out of here because we are going to destroy this place. Uh, God had said to Abraham in the previous chapter that he was going down to Sodom to see whether it was as bad as the outcry which had come to him and now it is beyond doubt that the city was quite as bad as the outcry and so its doom is sealed. And so Lot, he went out to his sons-in-law who were pledged to be married to his daughters and he tried to hurry them out of the city. Uh, but did you see verse 14? They thought... It sounded like a joke. So true to human nature, isn't it? They thought it sounded like a joke. Oh, no, God isn't really going to judge. God isn't really going to hold us to account. Now, I hope you won't mind. This is a slight indulgence on my part, but in your sermon outline today, I've given you a little grid that I dreamed up that shows four types of response to God's judgment. Uh, you see, I, I figured that when a person hears that God is going to judge the world, uh, they're either going to take it seriously or not, and they're either going to believe it or not. But the two are not quite the same thing. And so, you see, the first type of person is the one who doesn't believe and doesn't take it seriously. That's Lot's sons-in-law. They thought it was a joke. The British writer Douglas Adams, who wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, he's a bit like that. Uh, he was a light-hearted, whimsical atheist who didn't take it all too seriously and made lots of what is genuinely great humour. But then you see there's the person who takes the message seriously but doesn't believe. Now, I suggest that that's the person who gets offended. The townsmen, they got offended with Lot when he told them not to do the wicked thing that they were proposing. And they said, oh, you're playing the judge now. He came to us as a stranger. They were offended with him for judging them. 
The third person in the grid is the person who believes but doesn't take the gospel seriously. Now, I think that is the most interesting of them. That is the person who becomes the lukewarm Christian or the hypocrite. They say they believe, but they don't really live it out. In today's passage, the nearest to this is Lot himself. And and I also feel that the biggest risk for me is to be like Lot. And perhaps you would feel the same way about yourself. I think it's the main risk for most of us here that we would be like Lot. I mean, think about him. He's a believer, but he is living in this wicked town. Why is he living in this wicked town? Well, it's because he has chosen lifestyle over his soul when it comes to where he lives. Could I see myself at risk of that? Yes. He then unspeakably offers his daughters to the gang of men for the sake of hospitality. Now, I couldn't imagine myself ever doing that, but could my moral compass be thrown off by the people that I live with? I live around in the, in the, in the community that I live with? Yes, I could see that happening to me. And thirdly, as we're about to see, Lot was reluctant to abandon his lifestyle when the angels told him to flee from this lifestyle town, he he didn't want to do it. And could I see myself in that? Yes. Lot is a lot like the lukewarm Christian. And that's an example we mustn't follow. May God deliver us from people who believe the gospel but are not actually living it out. The correct response, of course, is the bottom right of the table to believe in Jesus Christ and to take him seriously. Now, we're going to see what that means in the rest of the story, although Lot is not going to be a good example. Uh, Having said that, I should point out that the New Testament maintains Lot was saved, right? Lot actually was saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. After Lot's sons-in-law had laughed at him, he came back to his house. It must have been quite late. And we see in verse 15 that at dawn, the angels urged Lot and they said, hurry, take your wife and your two daughters uh, and get out of the city, they said, that the city is going to be punished by God and we don't want you to be caught up in that. Now, you and I need to understand that in the New Testament, as as we read in our Gospel, Sodom and Gomorrah, these ancient cities, they're taken as an example of the fact that God is going to judge the whole world. God is going to judge the whole world and punish human evil. And this judgment that is to come, this is something that people need to flee from. We don't want to be caught up in it. And in fact, in the letter to the Hebrews... Chapter 6, verse 18, if you're a note taker, it speaks of Christians as those who have fled to Jesus. Under Jesus' protection, we are safe from the coming judgment. Jesus once likened himself to a hen who wanted to gather up her chicks under her wings and protect them. You see, we're safe under the protection of Jesus' wings in the face of the coming judgment. Why can Jesus' wings protect us? Because they were once stretched out on the cross where he paid the cost to deflect God's anger against all the wickedness of humanity. Have you thought about just how valuable Jesus' sacrifice must have been if it's able to pay for all human evil? That that Jesus' sacrifice is enough to cleanse the sin even of someone who has the blood of 500,000 people on their hands. Now, we don't know if that person is going to be saved. We don't know if that person will ever turn to Jesus. But Jesus' blood is enough to wash those sins away. It is valuable enough to turn all the stink of human evil into the beautiful aroma of justice and peace and goodness as the hymn says his blood can wash the foulest clean think about that today as you come up to receive the holy communion think about what 
an infinitely valuable death we are remembering. That is the reason why people can flee to Jesus. And my prayer today is that we wouldn't be ashamed to call ourselves one who has fled to Jesus. It may look as though there aren't very many people who've made that choice. What, there's 30 of us here today? There are people, though, in the world who are fleeing to Jesus. Do you know here on Friday night there were 300 youth, right? 300 young people who... Uh, it was the, the sort of every now and then gathering of all the youth groups from the eastern suburbs. Uh, I'm telling you that because uh, you might want to know why a handful of things are out of place this morning, though I think we did a pretty good job of tidying up. But also I want you to know that there, there are people who are fleeing to Jesus. But we need more. Who do you know that you could invite to come in here? Because they'll, they'll come. And hear the news that we can be protected under the wings of Jesus. The New Testament also says that we should flee from idolatry and sexual immorality. Uh, It specifically uses those phrases. Flee idolatry, uh, which is greed. Flee sexual immorality. See, those are the sins. They, They can get such a hold on our heart that we need to run from those sins before they get hold on us. Flee, it says. Flee from greed. Flee from sexual immorality. Fleeing is what Lot found it so hard to do. See there in verse 16? He hesitated, it says. He didn't want to leave. Lot had built this life for himself in Sodom, and he's like us, isn't it? We've built a life for ourselves, perhaps without Christ in our life at all, or perhaps if we've been a a lukewarm Christian, uh, then we've had Christ excluded from important parts of our life. And when the call of the gospel is to flee to Christ and escape the coming judgment, well, we're thinking, oh, but I don't want to lose that part of my life. Verse 16 is an amazing verse because it's the angels took Lot and his wife and the two daughters, two angels, four hands, four people that needed rescuing. They took them by the hands and they led them probably quite forcefully out of the town because they didn't want to go, you see. But God was merciful. He was forcefully merciful. He dragged them out. We reflected at our day away last weekend about how patient God is with our weaknesses because he knows our weaknesses And this is an example of it. And you may well feel, as I do, that God has grabbed you by the hand and he's dragged you and caused you to flee to Jesus because he knows you wouldn't have done that otherwise. And then when they were out of the city, verse 17, the angel said, flee for your lives and don't look back. Lot was still bargaining with them. Uh, in a section that wasn't printed for us, but Lot was bargaining with them. Oh, look, I don't want to have to go to the mountains. I don't think I can get there. Can I go to this little town? And the angel said, oh, yeah, okay, you can go to the town, but hurry up. Infamously, Lot's wife looked back and she turned to a pillar of salt. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It sounds like it was a volcanic eruption. Uh, we, we can't know for certain what the, what the reality was in, in that sense, but it was a terrible destruction. And verse 29 reminds us, if we were here last week, that God had saved Lot and his family as an answer to Abraham's prayers. There was a sad postscript to Lot's life, uh, which again was not read to us. It's a reflection that even though Lot could be saved... The sad consequences of sin still flow out in this life. But as I conclude, let me just hit a few points very, very briefly. First of all, human evil is real. Second of all, it's not just a policy problem, it's a heart problem. Human evil will be judged by God, which makes this life a serious business. I want to ask you, would you own for yourself the label The description is, would you call yourself someone who has fled for your life to Jesus? If you wouldn't call yourself that today, I want to to ask you why and, and why should today not be the day when you will say to Jesus, yes, Jesus, I want to turn from my sin 
and I want to be in your family and I want to be under the protection of your wings, which are the only wings that can save me from the coming judgment. Uh, if you have done that and said those things to Jesus, then I want to say to you, don't look back. Don't dabble in sin and don't envy the people who are staying in sin. But rather, praise the God who takes us by the hand and leads us firmly to Jesus. Because we're so reluctant, aren't we? Praise God that he's patient with us. But let's not look back. Let me pray. Father, we confess to you that like Lot, we are reluctant to follow you to safety, to the safety from the judgment which is rightly coming on the world. Father, please help us to flee to Jesus and not look back. And Heavenly Father, please, in your amazing grace, please add to your kingdom and grant that our family and friends, that they might be able to be here too and hear the news of your love and that you will lead us to the protection of the wings of your Son. We pray in his name. Amen. Please stand for our offertory hymn, number 216, Rejoice the Lord is King. Let us sing together.
Please be seated, everyone. And as we've been doing the last few weeks, I want to share a minute of hopes about next year, though I might make it even a short minute since uh, we're running a, a little late this morning. Um, I just want to speak about 4 p.m. Uh, service, which has been encouragingly uh, growing from where it started a couple of years ago. Uh, and I want to share with you the hope that we will be moving it back into the church. You see, 4 p.m., we began it uh, a few years ago to meet in the parish room, and the reason for that uh, was, uh, there are a few reasons, we wanted to create a family atmosphere where people would be meeting close together, and we also wanted to really make sure that people would stay for supper afterwards and wouldn't escape between getting uh, from the church to the parish room. And uh, I think that that has worked, and as I say, the congregation has grown. It's usually more than 30 people each week now. Occasionally it's touched 40. So we're encouraged by that, and our prayer uh, is that uh, hopefully early next year, uh, if it's regularly 40 people, that we might be able to say, yes, it's time for us to move back into the church because the space is forcing us to do that, but uh, still with that vibe and still with everybody coming back uh, across for supper. So that's the hope for 4 p.m. And I'm going to hand over to Andrew to pray. Let us pray for all people and for the church throughout the world. Almighty and ever living God, we are taught by your holy apostle to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all people. We ask you in your mercy to receive our prayers, which we offer to your divine majesty. We thank you for the cross-cultural partners at St. Jude's, and we pray today for Joel and Tiff Atwood working with CMS in Vanuatu. Thank you for the work they are continuing to do with local students, and we pray that the training they provide will be a blessing to many communities in that country. We pray that you will sustain them and their children in their faith and continue to grow them in love of you, those around them, and each other. We pray for St. Jude's early learning, and for the staff that they will be loving and wise educators in their roles, and for the, stu for the children that they will always enjoy their time there as they continue to grow. Thank you for the growing links between the Centre and St. Jude's Church. We pray that these will be strengthened in the future. We pray for our Friday friendship group. Thank you for the community that meets together in this group, for those who serve it, and for the blessing of fellowship it is to its members. Please grow this ministry so that it will continue to provide for those older members in our community who may be looking for friendship and a church community. We also continue to pray for Jim and Helen Lahure. Thank you that Helen is out of hospital and that they are now able to stay together at Little Bay. Please provide both Jim and Helen the support and strength that they need as she continues her recovery and enable them to always see you at work in their lives. We pray for the Sydney Anglican Synod starting this week. Thank you for all those who are able to attend. And we pray particularly for Andrew along with Karen and Edwina as they represent St. Jude's. Thank you for the time they are able to give to this important work. We pray that all the discussions at this meeting will give glory to you, will be full of thanks for your many blessings and will provide the churches of Sydney with a renewed passion to seek and save the lost. We also pray for the family and friends of Carolyn Snowden, who passed away September 16th in 2010. Please be with Libby and John and their family in their continued grief and enable them to know your love and care in all things. We pray for our hopes for the future here at St. Jude's and we thank you for the growth in our afternoon service. We pray for our plans to move the service into the church building next year and we pray that this will be a positive step for the congregation as it continues to grow. Please help us to make this change with sensitivity and care. And we pray for all our services that you will grow them in number, in love of you and each other, and in their desire to see more and more people in Randwick call on your name. We pray that you will lead the nations of the world in the ways of righteousness and peace and guide their rulers in wisdom and justice for the tranquility and good of all. Bless especially your servant Charles our King, his representatives and ministers, his parliaments and all who exercise authority in this land. 
grant that they may be impartially administer justice, restrain wickedness and vice, and uphold integrity and truth. We beseech you to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and to grant that all who confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially our Archbishop Kanishka, our Bishop Michael, and all who minister at St. Jude's, that by their life and doctrine they may set forth your true life-giving word and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. And to all your people give your heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that they may receive your word with meek hearts and due reverence and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We ask you of your goodness, Lord, to comfort and sustain all who are named in our prayer journal and all who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. We also bless your holy name for all your servants who have died in the faith of Christ. Give us grace to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of your heavenly kingdom. Grant this, Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only media, mediator and advocate. Amen. You who truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbour and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to strengthen and comfort you. But first, let us make a humble confession of our sins to Almighty God. Together, Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people. We acknowledge with shame the sins we have committed by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty, provoking most justly your wrath and indignation against us. We earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for all our misdoings. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father, for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please you in newness of life, to the honour and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you to do his will, and keep you in eternal life. Please stand for our next hymn, which you will find printed in our service outline, Jesus, Your Blood and Righteousness.
words of assurance for those who truly turn to Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believed in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the perfect offering for our sins. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, and our bounden duty, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Lord, mighty creator, and eternal God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with the whole company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory to you, O Lord Most High. Let us pray. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. All glory to you, our Heavenly Father, for in your tender mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death on the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray and grant that we who receive these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. I now invite those who are joining us online to take communion with me now. Let us take and eat in remembrance that Christ died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. And let us drink in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for us and be thankful.
as our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lord and Heavenly Father, we, your servants, entirely desire your fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and to grant that by the merits and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may receive forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present to you, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy and living sacrifice, humbly beseeching you that all we who are partakers of this holy communion may be fulfilled with your grace and heavenly benediction. And although we are unworthy through our many sins to offer you any sacrifice, yet we pray that you will accept this, the duty and service we owe, not weighing our merits but pardoning our offences through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom in the unity of the Holy Spirit all honour and glory are yours, Father Almighty, now and forever. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>